with that being said, Colossians chapter 3, you know, uh, we left off talking about the victorious Christian life and how that happens. How do we get victory in Jesus Christ, walking with Jesus Christ? And if you remember when I started this message, Paul writes to the church at Colossae um, primarily because they were being infiltrated with um, false doctrine from within and from without. Things started to infiltrate the church and things started to come in, teachings like, well, if you really want to know Jesus, if you really want to have victory in Jesus, you know, you have to be in touch with um, angelic beings and there's a deeper knowledge than just knowing Jesus Christ. There's something more that you have to get into mysticism and things like that. In legalism, you have to have, you know, do this and do that. You have to be circumcised to be saved and all this stuff started to infiltrate the church. So Paul writes to the church, and he, first of all, he tells them in chapter 1 that if you have Jesus Christ, you have everything. He's the creator. He's the sustainer. He loved you. He came to this earth. He died for you. He rose again, and he empowers you. So if you have Jesus and you know Jesus, you have everything you need, he says in chapter 1. Then in chapter, chapter 2 into chapter 3 is the beware chapter. Beware. Watch out for this. Watch out for legalism. People trying to tell you that you have to... Do this and do that in order to be saved. You have to add to the gospel in order to be saved. Beware of that. And then he says, beware of mysticism. Beware of these things that people that tell you that to really touch Jesus, you have to have a, a, a strange experience with the, you know, the other side and angels and things of that nature. He goes, that's a bunch of nonsense. And the, reason why, and the way he answers that is, why do you have to be in touch with angels when you can go straight to God? Very simple. This is what he says. Then he said, beware of strange doctrine when it comes to your body. You have to do certain things to your body. Asceticism. You have to torture yourself. Things like that. You see, see these strange things that people do. You have to walk on nails for 10 miles for, to be accepted of God. <laughs> strange. He goes, that's nonsense, he tells them. He says, if you have Jesus, you have everything. Then he says, beware of man's philosophies. Man's philosophies. Don't, get, don't go awry and get away from the scriptures and, and go away from Jesus Christ and gravitate toward man's philosophies and the things of this life for victory in your Christian life. Now, you can put yourself in their shoes. You can imagine how these things happen. Christians get saved, they receive Jesus, and they say, oh, thank you, Lord. You've come into my life. Heaven's my home. You know, I have a new life. I sent your presence, your spirit. You died for me. I didn't have to do anything to earn heaven, and now I'm going to heaven. Thank you, Lord. And then you start to walk with Jesus for a while. And the newness wears off of your conversion experience. You started to witness, tell people about Jesus, and maybe one person got saved, but not many are. People in your family think you're nuts now and you're crazy. Things like that start to happen. And, and, and then you really start to battle through some things. And then you start to battle with the sins of your own flesh that Jesus wants to start to clean up. And you can't have victory over those things. And you're battling through it. So you say, wait a minute. Maybe I need Jesus and this. Maybe I need Jesus and this philosophy. Maybe I need Jesus and mysticism, asceticism, whatever it is. When the scriptures give us the prescription for victory, it tells us, if you have Jesus, you have everything, and the way you get victory is in the spiritual realm. It's by obeying the word of God in prayer. That's what it is. That's what it always has been, and it has never changed. And, and I go as far as to say as God will not share his glory with any other way if you try to get victory any other way in your Christian life. It's just not going to happen. But the thing that's hard for us is to stay in that battle. It's easier for me to pick up Joe, you know, Joe Blow's book and say, can't you just tell me a couple things I can do to, to, to have some victory in this area than to get on my face day in and day out and say, okay, God, I'm, I'm weak. I'm nothing without you. I'm just a sinner. Please empower me. And again, and again, and again, to continually humble yourself over and over and over again. And we start to gravitate toward these other things. We start to gravitate toward asceticism, mysticism, legalism, all those isms. When you have Jesus Christ, you have everything. 
You have access to the Holy of Holies. You have access to all spiritual blessings in heavenly places in Christ Jesus. You have access in a relationship with God through Jesus Christ. So he writes this to them. He says, beware, watch out, don't go that way, don't do this. And then he tell, tells us in chapter 3, there are some things we can do to make sure we're safe and growing in that grace. There are some things we can do if we know Jesus and we have Jesus and we're walking with Jesus. There are some things we can put off and we can put on to continually have victory in Jesus Christ. Remember how he talks about Remember we talked about, if you then be risen with Christ, seek those things which are above. We're supposed to be Christians who live for eternity. So number one, when we start losing victory in this life and we start going awry, we have to ask ourselves, are we really seeking the glory of God and living for the kingdom of Jesus Christ? Are we living for heaven? If the answer is no, then we start to go awry. Are we raising our families for eternity? And then he says, too, set your affections on things above. Are you falling in love with Jesus Christ? Is he more beautiful to you today than he was five years ago or two years ago or six months ago? Set your affections on things above. And then he gets very practical. First, it's seek those things that are above. Set, set your affections on God and on things above. And then after that, right after that, then he starts to say, put off these things. Put off malice and anger. Put off the fleshly things that we do, lying, cheating, stealing. Put those things off. Literally, stop doing them. You know, people get aggravated because we tell them, hey, you know, Pastor Mac, you know, I'm, I'm battling through this, I'm battling through this, and I just, sometimes you have to tell them, well, stop doing that. Well, I knew that. Stop doing that. Don't do that anymore. Stop going there. Stop hanging out with that person. Stop doing that. Well, I knew that, but can't you tell me some kind of thing I can do so I can't stop doing that? And I was like, what do you want me to tell you? But I'm serious. This is what we, 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 you know what I'm talking about. We go through these things. And I'll say, you know, just don't, the Bible says, put that off. Stop doing that. But I can't. There's this inclination. It's just in me. And it's, yeah, it's called the sin nature. And we all have it. So if you're battling with alcohol, why do you got to go hang out with your friends at the bar? Stop doing that. If you're battling with pornography, Make sure your wife knows where the computer is at night and you don't know where it is. Stop doing that. Well, it can't be that simple. God says it is. It's a simple choice, but the battle to make the right choice isn't simple at all. He says the way we have victory in Jesus is to stop doing this, to put this off and put the new man on. That means start making right choices for the glory of God. Now he's going to get a little more intimate. He's going to talk to us a little bit more about practical matters, things we can do to continually have victory in Jesus and walk in the power of the Holy Spirit. Again, live in the Christian life. And having victory in Jesus Christ isn't about God just, you know, zap me from heaven with this, you know, holy electricity one day. Some churches will tell you that. I believe in being filled with the Holy Spirit. I believe in the baptism of the Holy Spirit. I believe in being empowered by the Holy Spirit. But the evidence of that is not speaking in tongues. I know a lot of Christians who speak in tongues that hate people. The evidence of that is the fruit of the Spirit in your life in obedience to the Word of God. That's the evidence. That's the evidence. Giftedness is not evidence. It's giftedness that God has given to you. By the way, not for you, but to bless other people. Now look what he says. Verse 14, above all these things, put on charity, which is love, love in action, which is the bond of perfectness. And let the peace of God rule in your hearts, to the which also you are called in one body, and be thankful. Now listen, the scriptures say that these are things we can do. These are things we can do. 
If you have Jesus and you know the Lord Jesus Christ and you've received Jesus Christ into your life, you have the knowledge of God, you have a relationship with God through Jesus Christ, and, and listen, if you want to have victory in Jesus Christ, what do we have to do? Seek those things that are above, set our affections on God, fall in love with Jesus, put off the old man, stop doing those things, start doing the things that glorify God, and then we have to what? Let the peace of God rule in your hearts. You have to let it. This is something you can do. Now, how does this work practically? Well, how do I have that peace? How do I have that peace? And I'm, you don't have to be perfect to have peace. You know that, right? Because if that was the case, you know, none of us would ever have peace about anything. Because we sin every day in thought, word, and deed. But it's the attitude of your heart and your life if you're walking in surrender to Jesus Christ. That you have a willing heart a willingness to put off the old things and put on the new things. You have a willingness to stop doing this and stop doing that and start doing this and start doing that. And you need to let the peace of God rule in your hearts. You need to let that happen. You say, well, you know, I make choices, I make decisions, and I don't have peace. Now listen, what does it mean to have peace? I'll give you an example in my life. You know, about a year ago, I, you know, was, I worked at Lowe's for eight years. I worked at Home Depot for, you know, three years before that as I was getting the church going. And, and um, you know, God finally, you know, he spoke to me while I was at Lowe's. And he says, you know, I want you to leave Lowe's. And I said, Lord. I said, Lord. I said, I don't want to put more of a burden on the church, number one. Number two. I was making $600 for working 15 hours. That was, that's pretty good for retail. You, people don't usually make that, all right? 15 hours, I was making $600. There's a whole story that goes with that, but it was good. 15, and I lived right, I lived right over there, and Lowe's is right over there. So I'm like, Lord, come on, Lord, because I already know what's going to happen, Lord. I know this is going to happen. We're going to be in a building project. People are going to leave. Things are going to happen in the church and this and that. And he said, well, that's, those things are probably going to happen. Because you, you think when you make a decision for God, right? Okay, God, I'm going to do this. I'm going to step out by faith. I'm going to do this. Then everything's just going to get easier, easier. God already revealed to me that things might get harder, but I had a peace about it. I had a peace. And you know what Bible verse kept coming to my mind? No man putting his hand to the plow and looking back is fit for the kingdom of God. That means stop looking back, stop worrying, and start looking this way. Keep going forward for me. And I said, okay, Lord. And I had a peace about it. My wife didn't have a peace about it. <laughs> but I had a peace about it. And sometimes you can't convince your wife to have a peace about it. And you can pray about it, and you can do all those things, and sometimes she won't have a peace about it, and sometimes she will. But she trusts that I was hearing from the Lord. Because I had a peace about it. And I'm going to tell this to you. If you don't have a peace about something, don't do it. Don't do it. Don't do it. Again, when you have peace about something, it doesn't mean that all the circumstances are going to get easier. Because sometimes they don't. But you know that you're hearing from God. You need to let, listen, let the peace of God rule in your hearts. You need to let God have his way in you. You need to get to a place in your life in the choices that you make and the decisions that you make where you say, okay, Lord, I, I sense that you're calling me to do this. I sense that you're calling me to do that. Or I sense that you want me to go there or do that, Lord. But you know what, Lord? I, I, I'm, I'm walking with you as long as I have you, as long as I, I'm in love with you. I'm okay with it. Now, that's hard when you have a family and you have people that you're accountable for. Let the peace of God rule in your hearts. People come up and say, Pastor Matthew, you think I should move here? Pastor Matthew, you think I should take that job? Do you think I should go over there? Do you think I should move to the other side of the country? Do you think I should go there? And sometimes I can discern right away. Well, if I was you, I probably wouldn't do that because it seems like you're running from you. You ever talk, you ever talk, do you ever go through that or talk to somebody like that? They're like, you know, if I, if I relocate, I'm going to go over here. I'm like, yeah, but you're still taking you with you. You know that, right? Okay. Because you're not going to be here now. You'll be in a climate that's 30 degrees warmer. But you're still there. You get that, right? 
No, no, but I think everything's going to work. No, 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 no. Laziness doesn't go away because you went from there to there. <laughs> Hate, hating people don't go away because you went from there to there. But some people ask me, you know, Pastor Matt, I got this going on, I got that going on, and I've got this. You think I should go there? You think I should go there? And I'm like, I don't know. Why not? Go ahead. You have as much ac access to God as I do. Do you have a peace about it? Let the peace of God rule in your hearts. And look what it says. These are things we can do. You need to let it. To the which also you are called in one body. And he says, and be ye thankful. That's something else we can do. We can be thankful. We can be thankful. God spoke to me as I'm reading this. And I'm studying this. Because I'm always like, Lord, how come more people aren't coming to church? How come people aren't getting more people aren't getting saved? Oh, we should be doing more baptisms. Oh man, there's you know the whole parking lot's filled up with cars, and over there there's two there's there's, there's a one spot that's empty over there behind a car. You know how we double stack people. So I go, Lord, oh, how come there's not a car in that spot? Oh, what am I doing wrong? You you guys don't do this. Okay, <laughs> that's what I do. All right. And know what God spoke to me. You're about to get up to teach those people to be thankful, and you're not thankful yourself. I said, you know what? Thankful for, I said, Lord, thank you for every car that pulled in here. Thank, thank you for everybody that's coming to hear your word. Thank you for the Christians who are battling through things and still showing up to church. Lord, thank, thank you that people got saved here many last year, and, and we just baptized 13 people a couple months ago. Thank you, Lord. God said, stop being thankful for what I have done and stop worrying about and torturing yourself and doubting my love because of things that aren't happening right now. See, these are things we can do. You can let the peace of God rule in your hearts. You can be thankful. But what happens is when we're battling through things and the pressure's on, all we can focus on is that one thing we don't have and that one problem in our relationship or that one issue at our job. That's all we can focus on and our whole world gets rocked because of that one thing. Well, Pastor Matt, I have two things. <laughs> and I got four. Yeah? But look at all the things you can be thankful for. Hundreds a day. Thousands. See, these are things we can do. We can let the peace of God rule. We can be thankful. Now look at And let the word of Christ Christ dwell in you richly in all wisdom, teaching and admonishing one another in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, singing with grace in your hearts to the Lord. See, that's something we can do. We can let the peace of God reign and rule in our hearts, right? We can let that happen. We can be thankful. And listen, what else can we do? Very simple. Let the word of Christ dwell in you richly in all wisdom, teaching and admonishing one another in psalms, hymns, and spiritual songs. You can do that. You know what that means? That means you can take the word of God, you can hear the word of God, you can obey the word of God, you can apply the word of God, and you can let his word dwell in you richly. You can let Jesus have his way with his word in your heart and in your life. He says, let it dwell in you richly. Now listen, we have to all take spiritual inventories all the time. We have to go back to Colossians 3 verses 1 through 7, and we need to say, hey, okay, Lord, can your word dwell in me? Lord, are you happy about these areas in my life? Or do I need to put some more things off and put some more things on? You can let this happen in your life. You can let his word dwell in you richly. And how does that happen? What do you do? That means instead of getting angry sometimes and full of wrath and full of worry and full of doubt, you can turn and sing and praise the Lord. Remember Paul and Silas, they're locked up. I think it's Acts chapter 17. They're locked up in prison for preaching the gospel, right? Right? And they're, they're not only locked up, right? They're putting stocks. You know what stocks are? You ever see those things from medieval times? The guy's head's like through the thing like this? All right. So they're stuck in those things. Feet apart. Their heads are through. They're, they're putting stocks. Now, if it's me, I'm sitting there saying, just kill me because I can't stand still for an hour and I'm forced to. Right? God, please take me out. I can't take it anymore. You know what they start to do? They start to sing. 
They start to praise the Lord. They start to sing a hymn together and praise Jesus. And you know what happened? God started tapping his foot like this. He didn't literally tap his foot, but this is his story, right? <laughs> All right. And as he tapped his foot, the prison started to shake. The bars opened. You know what? The stalks fell off, and they went out of prison. But they didn't go out right away. You remember what happened? They're released from prison. They're praising the Lord. They're giving God the glory. The Roman jailer looks in, and he goes, oh, man, what's going on? The, 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 the prison's open. Did these guys run out? And he's about to thrust himself through with a sword. Because if you were a Roman jailer in that time and your prison has escaped, it meant your life. So they're like, wait a minute, wait a minute, we didn't go anywhere. And he looks in and he goes, well, you guys are still here? What's wrong with you guys? Right? And he goes, well, we love Jesus. We were locked up for Jesus and the guy gets saved. Because they were thankful. They let the word of God dwell in them richly. And they started singing and praising the Lord, even in difficult times. See, these are things that you can do. These are things that I can do. Instead of turning to someone's vain philosophy and man's philosophy, instead of turning to legalism, asceticism, mysticism, instead of turning to everything else except for Jesus, you can praise Jesus and you can be thankful for Jesus and you can give Jesus some glory. You can do this. Say, Pastor Matt, that's easy for you to say. No, it's not. I have my own problems and my own issues, just like you do. But these are things that God's word tells me I can do to keep walking in victory with Jesus. And I say it all the time. You hear me say this all the time. When I meet with people and I counsel with people, because I know my prayer life. I know my own heart. I know the things I go through. And I'm like, Lord, man, if I spent one one hundredth of the time this week praying as I do eating, <laughs> some of you can identify with that. <laughs> one one hundredth of the time praying as I do eating, Lord, how much more peace would I have? And God says, yeah. So stop feeding your fat face so much and spend some more time in prayer. <laughs> Listen, I'm just saying that's what he says to me. I'm not calling anybody any names. This is what God speaks to me. I'm serious. <laughs> but then I ask people sometimes as they're battling through their own things. I'm like, listen, I feel like a hypocrite because I don't spend enough time in prayer myself and singing and praising the Lord. I'm like, I asked them, well, have you, have you spent any time in prayer? And this is what I get. Yeah, on the way to work, I spent a few minutes, you know, between songs. I said, how many times this week? Uh, whatever, once, I think. Well, have you got down on your face for five minutes a day about it? Well, no, no, I don't have time for that. And I said, well, you have time to talk to me for a half hour about it. Take that half hour and go to the Lord first. And, and most of the time when I say these things, people are like, oh, yeah, but it really doesn't work. And, uh, you know, I've tried that and I've done that before, but it do I don't know. And, you know, I'll just go try another church for a while and then they come back anyway. But, you know, but that's what happens. When the Bible says these are things we can do to have victory. Listen, some of us get depressed. Some of us get depressed. We get down. And it's, it's so interesting to me because, you know, Sometimes I get like the psalmist in Psalm 73. And it's a psalm of uh, Asaph. Remember the psalmist is looking out into the world. And he looks out into the world. And as he looks out into the world, he's like, Lord, it seems like the people that don't know you, they, they're just partying it up. And they get all this money and they're just blessed. And I'm like, Lord, I'm, I'm, I'm trying to serve you here, God. And, you know, it's hard. Why is it so hard for me? He goes, I almost lost my faith, he said. And that's true. Sometimes when you look out there and you look out at everybody else and they're like, it seems like they're, everybody else that's living for this world is so single-minded. Because they are. They're single-minded. Life is about either making themselves feel good or saving up enough money so they feel good or worshiping their career so they feel good. They're so single-minded. 
And then you come into the body of Christ and when half of us are, most of all of us, we're, we're divided all the time. Lord, I got to do this for you, but I'm, oh, Lord, am I, am I going too far with this? And Lord, I got to do that. And I got to, oh, about this in the world and one foot in, one foot out. And it's a constant battle. And you know what I say to that? That proves that you know Jesus. That proves that you know the Lord. That proves that you're on your way to heaven because there will be a constant battle. People that are in Satan's camp don't have that battle. They're single-minded for this world and that's it. God tells us to be single-minded for Jesus, but you know what? We have an adversary, the devil. And there's constant spiritual warfare all the time. Listen, if you don't believe it, really get on your face for one hour a day for one week. And then you'll see in the demonic realm, you'll see the other side. You'll see all those things that are really coming up against you and from that side. And this is why Christians turn to other things. This is why they turn to legalism. You know, I've been walking with Jesus for so long, and you know what? I really haven't gone anywhere, so I, now to make myself feel good, I'm going to do this, do that, and do this so I can prove to every other Christian and everyone else that I'm a little bit better than them. This is why Christians turn to mysticism. Because instead of fighting in that spiritual battle, listen, because it's a battle. It's painful. It's hard. It said Jacob had a wrestle in that arena. And who was he really wrestling against? He was wrestling with God until God broke him. And I think about this sometimes. And I think about the battle in my, my, in my Christian life and in my ministry and all these things. And I'm like, Lord, how much more do I really need to battle in that arena, Lord? But I don't want to. I'd rather just go to work every day and just care about my family and that's it. But God has made us for so much more. He has so much more for us. We can let the peace of God rule. We can be thankful. We can let Christ's word dwell in us by obeying it and by worshiping him in song. And we can give him glory, verse 17. And whatsoever you do in word or deed, do all in the name of the Lord Jesus, giving thanks to God in the Father by him. That means every single thing you do, this is something you can do. You can say, God, you know what? I'm doing this for your glory. I'm doing this for your namesake. And you know what that will help you with too? The things that you're not supposed to be doing, if you can't say, Lord, I'm doing this for your glory, then don't do those things. Now we're going to get really practical, and it starts with the wives. Wives, this is something you can do. All right, in regards to your home, how do you have victory in your home? Wives, submit yourselves unto your own husbands as is fit in the Lord. Literally, it's written like this. When it says, as it's fit, it means Jesus died for you. The least you can do, it's fit for you to submit to your husband. Submit to your husband. Now listen. It makes me, this, this makes me crazy, by the way. When like there's girls that are dating somebody or they're going out or whatever and they're starting to see each other and they're submitting to the dude. I'm like, you don't have to submit to him now. You don't have to do anything he says. And then it makes me crazy when, you know, guys want to go up and they want to put their arm around the girl that they're dating like they own them and they're not married to them. You don't have to submit to them. But once you're married, you do. Do you know what that means? You better do some um, feeling out. You better make sure. Test them a little bit. Try them. I told you, you know, whoever my daughter starts dating, I'm not letting her do that anyway. But <laughs> she's going to come. I'm going to, you know, the Ten Commandments. If you don't know them, out. <laughs> Name the 12 apostles as they were chosen in order by Jesus. <laughs> right? Out. See you later. But you know, my, 
my daughter's smart. You know what she says to me? Because the, the, the two things I pray with my kids for, I, say, I pray with them, and I say, Lord, help them to love you with all their heart, soul, mind, and strength, neighbor as themselves. Well, there's three things. Love the Lord, love the neighbor as themselves, and Lord, let, let them marry somebody that loves Jesus. That's, what I, that's the thing I care about most. And my daughter goes, well, Dad, what if he says he loves Jesus, but he really doesn't? Because that happens. And I said, well, God's put you close enough to me that I'll be able to keep my eye on that for a while. <laughs> To really make sure. To really make sure. But in relation to the home, wives, submit yourselves unto your own husbands. Now listen, what does that mean? You can't submit to him if he's in sin. You can't submit to him if he's saying, oh, hey, go get me some dope. Hey, get me a bottle. Hey, you know, let's watch some pornography together. You can't submit to that. Absolutely not. That's abuse. That's not submission. But you can submit to somebody that's saying, hey, I think we should make this choice, and I, I do love you, I care about this family, and you're like, looking at him like, you're, you're nuts, and you're crazy, I'm, I don't want to do that. But you know he's genuine, he's, like, he's really trying to like, do something right. Even though you might know it's wrong, and it's not going to work. You can still trust the Lord. You could say, okay, Lord, I believe that you love me more than he loves me, and because you told me to submit to this buffoon, I'll do it. <laughs> I'll do it. Seriously. And there's been times that my wife has, has submitted to my leadership, and I've, it's been wrong once. <laughs> Just once. Just once. Well, a lot more than once. But I've got to come back and I say, you know what, honey, I, I was wrong. I should have listened to your counsel. And there's been many times that she'll tell you that she didn't want to listen, and she submitted, and she'll say, honey, you were right. And that feels good. It really does. It really does. Because I hate being wrong most of the time. All right. But husbands, love your wives and be not bitter against them. Husbands, love your wives. Be not bitter against them. Guys, you have the harder job, as you well know. It says in Ephesians, love your wives as Christ loved the church and gave himself for it. That means if you're really loving that person, they're not, listen, God made a, Adam, a helpmate, not a slave. If he wanted to give him a slave, he would have made him a slave. He made him a helpmate to come alongside of him, to bounce things off, to talk about things together, to make decisions and choices together and go through life together to glorify God. That's what God did. He didn't make him a slave. And that's why loving your wife is listening to her. Loving your wife is saying, you know what, honey? You might be a little smarter than me in, the, in, in this. You know what I do in my house? Thank you, honey, that you can do a lot of things. You can do it. <laughs> Have at it. You want to do the finances? Go ahead, because I don't want to do it. Should I, I should take more of that burden, I know, but she's good at it. I have no problem with those things. Works out different in every home, but you know if you're loving your wife. You know. And sometimes it's the little things. The little things. I could tell you a ton of story about little things that go on in my home. But I won't. You just sit in the same, please tell me some of those stories. <laughs> All right, I'll tell you one. <laughs> tell you one, just one, and then I'll, and I'll, and I'll, I'll hurry up. All right, just one. So we have this little closet and, and this little area, and she wanted to put these, she wanted to buy these things to go in there to make it more organized. And I said, honey, it's not going to work. It doesn't fit. I'm the one that does a little bit of construction, just a little, and, and I know that I, it's not going to work. I know you want to get it in there. You want to get it organized, and it's not going to fit. It's not going to work. And she kept insisting. I'm like, it's not. I'm all right, what? I said, okay. Just so she knows I love her, we'll go get those things, and lo and behold, they didn't fit. But I don't care. I did it. Just a little thing. Just so she knows, you know what, I, I listen to you, I value you, I, I want you to at least see yourself that it's not going to work. <laughs> Where I could have been a tyrant, a dictator, no, I submit, we're not doing that, I'm not spending the $29 on that thing, you're not valuable enough for me to waste $29. Think about that for a second. But that's what we do sometimes. But it didn't work. But just so she know that I, I care. And it's not the $29, and it's not this and not that. Just she knows that I love her. Those little things go a long way sometimes. 
and loving your wife. Now the kids. Children, obey your parents in all things, for this is well-pleasing unto the Lord. Listen, the scriptures, all, they address children four times in the New Testament. Every time it's in obedience to parents. Obey your parents in all things. Listen, it's scary because we live in a day and age that kids just get to do whatever they want. And parents are afraid to discipline their kids because someone's going to call somebody on them. And sometimes my wife's got to calm me down. She does. I'm like, Larissa, I'll go to jail before I let them get away with that. I will whoop them right in front of 100 people if I have to. And she's like, you can't do that. DCF and blah, blah, blah. I say, call them then. Because they're smart, you know. I was one of them. I was. You know, knowing you can say stuff and get away with stuff because there's other people around. You say, watch, you watch when we get home. You watch. Right? Because kids need to obey. Listen, there's a reason why God made me 250 pounds and they're a lot lighter than that. I'm saying, can, no, can you imagine what they, listen to me. Can you imagine what their mindset that they have? If they, were, if they came out bigger and stronger than you? <laughs> Seriously, can you imagine what would happen in your house? They'd run roughshod over you in two seconds. There's a reason why you're bigger. You say, oh, that's mean. That's terrible. No, it's not. God's smart. <laughs> Seriously, he is. He knows that I have to put fear in them sometimes. They have to say, we're not doing that. And if you don't like it, you're going to get it. This is archaic to some people. But I'm just telling you, there's a reason why. God knows what he's doing. Now, listen, maybe you don't have to go to those lengths and ends in your home because your kids are maybe like a little nicer than mine. I don't know. <laughs> but sometimes I have to. Sometimes I do. Because they need to obey. And you know what the scriptures say? This is the hard part. They need to obey right away. Right away. How come I have to say things? Once, twice, three times, four times, and then when my voice goes up, then I get a little motion. Then it goes up a little more, and then a threat comes with it. Then they start to do something. You know what the Bible says? Delayed obedience is disobedience. Delayed obedience is disobedience. Because God knows something. God knows, listen to me, God knows if kids can't obey their parents, they're going to be forced to obey somebody else. They're going to be forced to obey the authorities. They're going to be forced to obey, the, to obey the laws of the land. And that's a lot more harsh because there's no love in that. And God knows if you have a generation of kids that run around and just get to do whatever they want, when they want, when they want, then that's going to overflow into society. And you know what you have? Chaos. Chaos. Nobody enforcing the word of God. Nobody saying, no, you can't do this. This is not right. God is not glorifying that. No, you're not going to do that. Nobody's saying those things. Look what happens. Just look outside. Look out there. We, we have a whole generation in a, 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 of kids and people that, the, listen, the Bible says the days will come when they'll call evil good and good evil, and those days are here. Parents aren't even allowed to parent their kids because someone might step in. Chaos. See, this happened in the Bible many times when parents didn't enforce the word of God with their kids and force them to obey and tell them this is what you're going to do and tell them this is what God expects of you. And you know what happened? Read the book of Judges. They, everybody did what was right in their own eyes. Scary. Now we have a whole generation of kids running around like that. We have a whole generation. Listen, we got kids going to school that they don't have to tell, the young girls don't have to tell their parents that they're going to get an abortion. Listen, this is true. But everything needs to be signed off on and I's dotted and T's crossed if you want to take some Tylenol to school because you have a headache. Don't you see like something's off there? But that's what we live in crazy children obey your parents in all things this is listen well pleasing unto the lord fathers don't provoke your children to anger lest they be discouraged listen i got a bunch of kids and everyone's a little bit different 
And I wish I could say, I just have to do this with all of them. I did this with this one. I do the same exact thing with that one and the same exact thing with that one and everything just works out. But you know it doesn't work that way. They have their own gifts and talents. They have their own things that, their ups and the downs and the things that they battle with. And I get a minister to each one of them differently and separately. And then one will start to say to me, well, how come that person, did they get to do that about their brother or sister? How come they can do that and how come I can't do that? And how come they got this and I get that? And I say, because you're not them and they're not you. But I say, it doesn't mean that I love you is any different. Because I love you is the same. Isn't that the way God deals with us? Doesn't he? He knows how much we can handle some of us, and some of us can't handle something. And then you might be able to handle something else that this person can't handle. God knows because God loves us. Let's get through a few more verses and we'll close. He's going to move from the home to work, business, and society. Now, these are things we can do to have victory in our Christian lives, and we'll close. Servants, obey in all things your masters according to the flesh, not with eye service as men pleases, but in singleness of heart, fearing God. Now, listen, there were servants and masters back then, literally. Sometimes you sold yourself into slavery because you owed a debt. And he says, servants, obey them in all things. You know what it says? Listen, it says unto the Lord. You know what that means? That means, and it says, not what I service. That means you know the Lord's watching you. That means you're not going to be a person that you have a task and you'll just work on it when when the boss comes around. You know what I service is? Oh, here they come. There they go. Here they come. And there they go. See, God God sees all that stuff. God knows. God knows what's going on in the heart of of man and says you do it for Jesus. You do it as unto the Lord because God is watching. And whatsoever you do, do it heartily as to the Lord. This is something we can do. As to the Lord and not unto men, knowing that, that of the Lord, you shall receive the reward of the inheritance for you serve the Lord Christ. But he that doeth wrong shall receive for the wrong which he's done. And there is no respect of persons. Masters, give unto your servants that which is just and equal, knowing that you also have a master in heaven. So he's saying, if you're a boss, don't take advantage of somebody. Pay them what they're worth. Continue in prayer. This is something we can do. And watch in the same with thanksgiving. With all praying also for us. Paul says, pray for us. That God would open unto us a door of utterance to speak the mystery of Christ for which I also am in bonds that I may speak, that that I may, may make manifest as I ought to speak. Walk in wisdom toward them that are without. Redeem the time. Let your speech be always with grace, seasoned with salt, that you may know how you ought to answer every man. He's saying, be a witness for Jesus Christ. Speak the truth. And let's just read the closing remarks and we'll close. This is where Paul gets personal. All my state shall take a kiss to clear unto you who is a beloved brother and a faithful minister, fellow servant in the Lord, whom I have, spent, whom I have sent unto you for the same purpose, that he might know your estate and comfort your hearts, with Onesimus, a faithful and beloved brother who is one of you. They shall make known unto you all things which are done here. Aristarchus, my fellow prisoner, salutes you. He was in jail with Paul. And Marcus, sister's son, to Barnabas, touching whom you received commandments, if he come unto you, receive him. And Jesus, which is called justice, this isn't Jesus, this isn't Jesus Christ, it's another Jesus, which is called justice, who are of the circumcision, these only are my fellow workers unto the kingdom of God. He doesn't say they were legalists, they were Jews, which have been a comfort to me. Epaphras who is one of you, a servant of Christ, salute you always, laboring fervently for you in prayer, that you may stand perfect and complete in all the will of God. For I bear him record that he has a great zeal for you. And then that that are in Laodicea, and them that are in Hierapolis, 
Luke, the beloved physician, and Demas greet you. Salute the brethren which are in Laodicea and Nymphus and the church which is in their house. And when this epistle is read among you, cause that it be read also in the church of, of the Laodiceans, and that you likewise read the epistle from Laodicea. And say to Archippus, take heed to the ministry which thou hast received in the Lord, that you fulfill it. The salutation by the hand of me, Paul, remember my bonds, Grace be with you. Amen. Amen. Paul, always at the end of his epistles, is very personal. He mentions people. Aristarchus, Luke, Demas. He mentions people that are helping with him, that, that are helping him serve. Epaphras, you know why? Listen to me, and I'll close with this. Because we're a body. We're a body. I can't do this by myself. Neither can you. We can't do any of this by ourselves. Listen. You say, Pastor, I thought you were going to close. I'll close right now. <laughs> Remember I sent out, I don't know if you got this email, but I sent out about a month ago, God put it on my heart, just to thank all the different ministries in the church. And with a church of two, 250 people, we had a lot of ministries. Man. We got home fellowships. We got people that open up their homes. We got men's ministries. We got ladies' ministries. We got a bread ministry. We got... All kinds of different ministries. And as I'm, as I'm doing this, God wanted me to send this email. Just thanking everybody because somebody does something around here for the Lord Jesus Christ, things that I can't see. And then I said, as I'm reading all these things out and I'm writing them and I'm emailing just to be thankful for all these things and thank you for serving alongside me, I'm like, Lord, I'm forgetting something. I'm forgetting somebody. Lord, I don't know what's going on. But it just kept coming and coming and coming. So many people do so many things for the glory of Jesus Christ because it's personal. And it matters. And sometimes we think what we do is not seen. But you know what? God sees it. And it does matter. And that's what Paul's saying at the end of this epistle. I'm thankful for this person. I'm thankful for that person. I'm thankful for this person. This person prays. This person labors. Listen, only eternity will tell. Only eternity will tell. The things that you do for Jesus Christ and how they affected other people. I know I'm going to be in heaven one day and God's going to say, hey, it was because of this person's prayer and that person's gift that that was able to get you on another year. And I'm going to say, thank you, Lord. Because everything you do matters. Let's pray. Lord, I just thank you so much for this body, your people, Lord. Lord, I thank you for your word. Lord, I thank you for your love for us, Lord. And I just ask that you'd pour out your spirit afresh upon your people, Lord. Lord, I ask in Jesus' name, Lord, that you would search every heart here, Lord, and that you would try us, Lord, and you would make us more like your son, Lord. You would help us to love the way he loves, serve the way he serves, Lord, give the way he gives, Lord, have compassion the way he has compassion, Lord. Bless your people, Lord. In Jesus' name.